because there is no limiting principle in the constitutional text that would empower the Senate to convict former officers that would not also let them convict and disqualify any private citizen. An absurd end result to which no one subscribes. Article 2, Section 4 must have force. Tells us the President, the Vice President, and civil officers may be impeached and convicted. Donald Trump's no longer the President. Likewise, the provision states that officers subject to impeachment and conviction shall be removed from office if convicted. Shall be removed from office if convicted. As Justice Story explained, the Senate, upon conviction, is bound in all cases to enter a judgment of removal from office. Removal is mandatory upon conviction. Clearly, he explained, that mandatory sentence cannot be applied to someone who's left office. The entire process revolves around removal. <coughs> if removal becomes impossible, conviction <coughs> becomes insensible. In one light, it certainly does seem counterintuitive that an officer, office holder can lose that conviction by resignation or expiration of terms, an argument we heard made by the manager. But this underscores that impeachment was never meant to be the final forum for American justice. Never meant to be the final forum for American justice. Impeachment, conviction, and removal are a specific intra-governmental safety valve. It is not the criminal justice system where individual accountability is the paramount goal. Indeed, Justice Story specifically reminded that while former officials were not eligible for impeachment or conviction, they were, and this is extremely important, still liable to be tried and punished in the ordinary tribunals of justice. Put another way, in the language of today, President Trump is still liable for everything he did while he was in office ordinary citizen, unless the statute of limitations is run, still liable for everything he did while he's in office. Didn't get away with anything yet. Yet. We have a criminal justice system in this country. We have civil litigation. And former presidents are not immune from being accountable by either one. I believe the Senate was not, was right, not to grab power the Constitution doesn't give us. And the Senate was right not to entertain some light speed sham process to try to outrun the law. It took both sides more than a week to produce their free trial brief. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So, okay. Uh, okay. 
So we're, we're going to do six yeah. and, and rotate. Okay. Right. We were so I, I mean, the companion. I think six sounds like fine. Trisha said five. Oh, oh. I, I defer to you guys. I mean, well, there's they have the six spots. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'll do six. Okay. okay. Fine. 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 Yeah. Um, Okay, so you guys still will maintain the rotation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. okay. that Sound good, guys? Yep. Yeah. I'm fine with that. Are we so doing first come, first serve, Jim? I'm saying Trish is asking five, but we've got to start with She gave me an AP Getty New York Times orders. Or before. And now I'm out of the six for that. You can't ignore six on the list. Okay. So we're going to rotate. Simply show it. Does that hurt you? No. Or the Obama president failed to do it. To, to begin with. But I'm going to go out. Yeah. Okay. Once I rotate, I'm going to go too. So, yeah, there's six. Scouts will just go to six. So we do six, and then we all leave. Senator from Maryland. Other people come in. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do five minutes at a time. Uh, we we're quicker than that, actually. I think okay. Yeah, we're very fast. Jim. Okay. Thank you. To evict the former president of the United States, Donald Trump. Of the articles of impeachment presented by the House of Representatives in regards to the incitement of insurrection. Thanks, Jim. Throughout his presidency, Donald J. Trump has violated his oath of office to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. There are many examples that I could give of how he's violated his oath of office. So, how are we going to do about filing? basis of the first article yeah, to be last year of violating his oath of office. Manny, we're going to file in the hallway. Manny, we're going to file in the hallway. All right. So when we rotate out, we'll file. Just so it's clear. Right. Are you okay with that? We're looking for the third. I want to make sure. I want to hear it. So we're going to do six. I don't want to six things. Ago, and even before the November elections, when President but Trump I really want to, you guys, the polls were showing that he might lose in the election, the need to acknowledge that he would accept the election results if he lost. He didn't say that once in the November elections. He said it on several occasions. No, I brought no. Talked about a rotate down. Right, so we're going to rotate you in on the next group. We're doing six. Six. That's not for me, that's for the gallery. So we, when we get done, we rotate out, we're going to file in the hall. I'm just asking that. She's like, our cousin. I just want to make sure so we're all on the same page. So the guy's cool. That's pretty good. Why is this not? Donald Trump called that into the question. Why are you? Then came the November 3rd election. And shortly thereafter, Joe Biden was declared to be the winner. Why? Because he had the most votes. Over 7 million. But he was declared the winner because of the electoral vote. 306 to 232. By the way, the same electoral vote. Donald Trump won four years earlier, in which Donald Trump called the last one. But then came the legal challenges by President Trump. He didn't accept the electoral vote or the declared elections. And he has his right to contest the elections in the court, asking for recounts or asking for challenges. But in every one of those cases, he could not establish widespread fraud that would have changed the results in any one of the states, let alone enough electoral vote changes to change the outcome of the election. But did he stop after he was denied relief in all of those legal challenges? The answer is no. He further tested by trying to inappropriately interfere with state election officials and state public officials, urging them to take action to change the certificated results. Now, we have many examples that during this period of time, he's talking about a fraudulent election, a stolen election, all the different things about raising questions yeah, the legitimacy of the voices of the people of this nation. We have 
so many examples of his interference. But we actually have the tape of his conversation with the Georgia Secretary of State that we all heard and heard how the president tried to intimidate and threaten the Secretary of State of Georgia in order to change the certified election results of the votes of the people of Georgia. Clear examples of how President Trump violated his oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. But that wasn't the end of it. He went to his Department of Justice, believing the Department of Justice is his Department of Justice, not the Department of Justice of the United States of America. Now, let's remember that the Department of Justice had found no widespread corruption. In fact, they had determined this is one of the cleanest elections, one of the least uh, problem elections that we've had. Didn't stop President Trump from trying to intimidate the, and order his Department of Justice to conduct an additional investigation to find fraud to overturn the will of the people, once again violating his oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. He continued to do this contrary to his constitutional obligations. Corrupt elections, Are you still stop the steal, rigged elections, tremendous fraud, all words that he used after the November 3rd election. He right. knew what he was I saying Senate was a lie. He say. knew there was no widespread <laughs> fraud. But he continued to use the office of the presidency and his voice to promote the big lie. And he knew his followers would believe it. He knew he could convince his loyal followers to believe that this was a rigged election, a stolen election. Again, compromising our democracy for the will of the people to determine who our leaders are. And he knew his followers would be motivated to action because he knew he could motivate his followers. He put himself before the nation, before his responsibility as president of the United States. He put his own self-interest above his responsibility under the Constitution of the United States and to the people of this nation. And then he summoned his loyal following to Washington on January 6th. He knew they were coming. He knew dangerous people were in the group. He knew the Proud Boys were there, which he had directly said, stand back and stand by. He knew that they were ready for violent action. And then he incited the mob to action on January 6th. We know the words that he used. We saw the videos. We, he's part of the record of the impeachment trial. We will never surrender. We will never concede. We will stop the steal. Stolen election. All words that he had been using during the entire 2020 election cycle. And particularly when he thought he was going to lose. But the most damning part of the president's violation of his oath of office, the most serious part, is what he did and did not do after seeing the violence of us in the United States Capitol, after the Capitol was penetrated, after we saw the violence being committed, where we knew that the members of Congress were in danger, the Vice President of the United States was in danger, the people that work here were in danger, the people, the, the press, all the people that are in the Capitol legitimately were at danger. We all saw that. And the President of the United States knew of that. And he did nothing to stop the violence. He could have called off his loyalty. He told him to get out of the Capitol. He didn't do that. He could have sent in the National Guard in order to protect us. He didn't do that. And he never condemned the participants in this mob in penetrating the Capitol for what they did. I'm going to 
sort of summarize uh, my feeling about that by agreeing with Representative Liz Cheney, the House Republican Conference Chair, who said it on the floor of the House, let me just quote her statement, the President of the United States summoned this mob, assembled this mob, and did the flame of this attack. Everything that followed was his will. None of this would have happened without the President. The President could have immediately and forcefully intervened to stop the violence. He did not. There has never been a greater betrayal by a President of the United States of his office and his oath to the Constitution. I agree with that. President Trump violated his oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. He violated that. So let's take a look at what he did do after knowing the violence that occurred. This tweet of 224 p.m. Now, this is after the Vice President had been removed from presiding in the chamber after we knew the violence that was taking place in the capital of the United States, he was aware of all that. He knew that we had shut down the operations of the House and the Senate, that there was violence taking place within the Capitol, and that his vice president was the target of that attack. And when he tweeted at 2.24 p.m., Mike Pence, I'm quoting the book, Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what he should have been been done to protect our country, and blaming the group even more for violence after he knew that it's a violent circumstance. He had known violence had taken place. We heard in the record of the Chief Patrol today, Congress, we'll go with that. I'm okay with that. Which again is during this period of time. No, the problem is it's, here we are. if they tell us that, and then we abide to that, and we switch it, it's not really fair. So at this point, we should. <laughs> and if you're Bloomberg, that's fine. I'm not concerned about it. If somebody was to make a stink about it, it maybe you'd be on NYT, but they got here late, to be fair. You can put them off the line. That's my... Okay. And what did the leader say? What did the president say? I guess, Kevin, these people are more upset about the election than you are. Here we have... So guys, we're at the sixth capacity. So everybody else has got to go outside. We're going to rotate in. That's for the gallery, not us. Putting his own interest above the safety of the people that he has sworn to protect as our commander and chief. And then at the end of the day, about six o'clock, he sends out a tweet. That really sums up his feelings about what these people were doing. These are people who came into the Capitol. They killed people. They, they Alex people. Edelman, yourself, me, Manny, and Graham. They invaded the Capitol. The and then we'll rotate in a couple minutes. We're just following whatever they said. The six allowed in. So how does the right now. send up, sum up today? This tweet? These are the things that happen when a safe landslide victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from is great just a patriots. Do you have any I have nothing about that. Who have been badly and unfairly treated for so long. Go home with heart and in peace. Remember this day for every time. Repeat it with a big lie. That's what President Trump did. Rather than bringing in the National Guard, rather than telling the people to go home, right, rather so than being concerned about the safety of right. the White House, the, right. the, 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 the President of the United States, he violated his oath of office over and over and over again. The entire practice that we've seen for so long, it clearly establishes that he incited an insurrection against our country, that the facts 
included as the basis for the article for the pizza brought to us by the House of Representatives has been proven. The purpose of impeachment is not just the accountability of the president, but also to protect our constitution. And make sure this conduct never happens again. No one is above the law, even the President of the United States. Everyone who had, was responsible for insurrection that occurred on January 6th should be held accountable for those who broke into the Capitol and caused the harm and damage to the President of the United States and who incited the violence. That's why I voted to convict President Trump of the Articles of Impeachment for inciting an insurrection. And that's why I would have voted to disqualify him from ever holding an office of trust again. But that was the president I yield before. And can I ask the unanimous consent that my entire statement has been addressed? There's no objection. democracy is the peaceful transfer of power after the voters choose their leaders. In America, we accept election results even if our candidate does not prevail. If a candidate believes that there is fraud, the courts can hear and decide those issues. Otherwise, the authority to govern is vested in the duly elected officials. Mr. President, on January 6th, this Congress gathered in the Capitol to count the votes of the Electoral College pursuant to the process set forth in the 12th Amendment to the Constitution. At the same time, a mob stormed the Capitol, determined to stop Congress from carrying out our constitutional duty. Mr. President, that attack was not a spontaneous outbreak of violence. Rather, it was the culmination of a steady stream of provocations, provocations by President Trump that were aimed at overturning the results of the presidential election. The president's unprecedented efforts to discredit the election results did not begin on January 6th. Rather, he planted the seeds of doubt many weeks before votes were cast on November 3rd. He repeatedly told his supporters that only a rigged election could cause him to lose. Thus began President Trump's crusade to undermine public confidence in the presidential election unless he won. Early on the morning of November 4th, as the yeah. ballots continued to be counted, President Trump claimed victory and asserted that Democrats were trying to steal the election. On November 8th, the day after several media outlets had declared Joe Biden the apparent winner based on state-by-state -state results, President Trump tweeted, this was a stolen election. With that, Mr. President, his post-election campaign to change the outcome began. Over the ensuing days and months, the president distorted the results of the election, continuing to claim that he had won, while court after court threw out his lawsuits and states continued to certify their results. President Trump's falsehoods convinced a large number of Americans 
that he had one and that they were being cheated. The president also mm -hmm. embarked on a new Oh, no. Yeah, they did. Um, they did have a password. Oh, for house side? No. Or house side is still house public, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Senate side it is. But, it's, but it's, it's, it's capital H, capital, H, capital P, squished together. It's been like 10 years. We need to come and take every of all the information. So you got to squish the two words together and make a P and capital too. Nobody can crack that code. Could be intimidating, threatening the election officials She's in Georgia. I just want to find 11,780 votes, he stated, seeking the exact oh, number of votes oh, to change the outcome in that state.
Michael Scalzi. Yeah. You start the rotation whenever you think it is. What? You start. I will. Hey, Manny, we're going to move this right. Um, hello, everyone. I want to start by thanking the American people for engaging so seriously with this process. Um, and I want to thank the members of the Senate, and I want to thank the members of the House, and I want to thank uh, the terrific members of the uh, House impeachment manager team. Um, Trump stormed our house with the mob he incited, and we defended our house. And he violated our Constitution, and we defended the Constitution, and they tried to trash our democracy, and we revived it, and we protected it. Um, this was the most bipartisan presidential impeachment in the history of the United States, and we know that impeachment, for reasons that we could explore at some other time, often becomes partisan, but this was the most bipartisan presidential impeachment event in the history of the country. It was also the largest Senate vote for a presidential impeachment, 57 to 43. And of course, the vote to impeach was 232 to 197 uh, in the House. So we have uh, a clear and convincing majority of members of Congress that the president actually incited violent insurrection against the union and against the Congress. Um, Senator Mitch McConnell just went to the floor essentially to say that we made our case on the facts, that he believed that uh, Donald Trump was practically and morally responsible for inciting the events of uh, January 6th. He described it as we did, as a disgraceful dereliction of duty, a desertion of his office, and um, he made a, a series of uh, statements that we didn't even make, saying that this was not over yet by a long shot, essentially, and that um, there was the path of criminal prosecution um, for uh, the former president, the disgraced and now twice impeached um, former president. So uh, the bottom line is that um, we convinced a, a big majority uh, in the Senate of our case. I'm very proud of the exceptional hard work of these managers who worked through the night, uh, many nights over several weeks, um, to make this case to the Senate and uh, to the union. Um, as to, um, I just want to say, you know, one word about the whole thing about witnesses. We were able to get um, treated uh, as uh, as live under oath testimony, the statement of our colleague, Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler. Uh, we were able to get a stipulation to that and get it into uh, evidence today by asking for her uh, as a witness. Um, if you listen to Mitch McConnell and the Republicans 
uh, who are now hurriedly explaining why they voted not to convict, all of them are hinging it on a legal argument, jurisdictional or some other legal argument that um, could never be overcome by any number of witnesses. We could have had 5,000 witnesses and Mitch McConnell would be making the same speech because what he's asserting is that the Senate never has jurisdiction over a former president. And for reasons I don't need to belabor because a big part of the trial was about this, we reject that completely. It's totally at odds with our history, the Blunt case, the Belknap case, um, the text of the Constitution, the original intent of the Constitution, the original understanding of the Constitution, the Senate's own precedents, and so on. But in any event, the point is that no number of witnesses demonstrating that Donald Trump continued to incite the insurrectionists even after the invasion of the Capitol would convince them. They, they wouldn't be convinced. They were hinging it on a matter of law, which we thought we had settled back on Tuesday, of course, when the Senate elected to exercise jurisdiction and to reject that jurisdictional constitutional argument. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, Mitch McConnell clearly feels that uh, Donald Trump remains a huge problem for the Republican Party, even if he has been disgraced in the eyes of the country. And uh, that is not my jurisdiction, and I really don't have anything to say about that. I think, you know, they will uh, have to deal with the political dynamics uh, within, their, within their own party. So um, we, did get, um, we did get Donald Trump at least to admit that he's a former president now, so that's good news. Uh, he's not asserting that somehow he's still president, um, and they're recognizing, at least in a de facto sense, um, the legitimacy of this presidential election, which, of course, President Biden won by more than 7 million votes and by a margin um, of 306 to 232, 306 to 232 in the Electoral College. With that, I will close my remarks, and the questions are open for uh, any of us, and I'm going to uh, share the podium with my distinguished colleagues. Okay. Yes, my name is All right. Um, somebody else want to take a shot at that? I thought I addressed that, but anybody else want to? Yes, please, Stacey. Listen, we heard from this from the minority leader, Mitch McConnell, that we have proven the case. He said specifically, the House managers have proven the facts of the case. And before we started um, yesterday, we knew when we rested, we rested with overwhelming evidence as to the facts of this case. These all jurors were also witnesses to the crime. They knew specifically what was happening. Um, and then there was, you know, we found additional information about Herrera Butler, which we, on yesterday evening, we decided that we were going to go after. And we got it. We got that information to further amplify what we had already proven there in court. There is no other additional witnesses that we were friendly to us that were not there on the screen the body cameras of the Capitol Police officers, how much more resonance would that have given to them than the actual seeing the day of the insurrection? Individuals that uh, others of us would have liked to have called, like the president who we invited, is in fact the defendant and does not have to testify. Other individuals who may have been there with the president were not friendly witnesses to us and would have required subpoenas and months of litigation. They are still litigating McGahn in impeachment one a year later. And so we believe that we have shown that this president is a disgrace to our country. Mitch McConnell himself said that. These senators have decided to hang their hat on jurisdictional grounds, which are not based in the evidence, which are not based on the facts, and they will have to be judged for that. We have done our duty to the American people. I'm, I'm, well, let me introduce uh, Speaker Pelosi, and I'll come to you next. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> it had not been my intention to come to this uh, press availability, 
uh, uh, however tempting it would be to sing the praises of our House managers on behalf not only of the House of Representatives, on behalf of the American people. And I have to say personally, on behalf of my grandchildren, who drew great hope and inspiration from each and every one of you. We could not be prouder of, of your patriotic presentations, the clarity in which you presented, and again, uh, the inspiration that you have been to so many people. So I thank you for that. When I see all of them, it reminds me that when we recruit candidates to run for office or we see them self-recruiting, we always say, and they'll say, well, I could be the president of my university or I could be the head of my hospital department or this or that. And so I have to think about whether I run for Congress. We always say, we don't want anybody without options. That's why we're looking to you to run, because you have options. That shouldn't be a reason for you not to run. But what we saw in that Senate today was a cowardly group of Republicans who apparently have no options because they were afraid to defend their job, respect the institution in which they serve. Imagine that it would be vandalized in so many bad ways that I won't even go into here and that they would not respect their institute. That the president of the Senate, Mike Pence, hang Mike Pence, was the chant, and they just dismissed that. Why? Because maybe they can't get another job. What is so important about any one of us? What is so important about the political survival of any one of us? that is more important than our Constitution that we take an oath to protect and defend. But why I came over was because I listened to Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell, who when this distinguished group of House managers were gathered on January 15th to deliver the articles of impeachment, could not, we're told, it could not be received because Mitch McConnell had shut down the Senate and was going to keep it shut down until right, until the inauguration. So for him to get up there and make this indictment against the president and then say, but I can't, I can't uh, vote for it because it's after the fact, the fact that he established, the fact that he established that it could not be delivered before the inauguration. Now, when you think about January 6th, between January 6th and January 20th, you're only talking about just under two weeks, a day under two weeks. So the big lie, uh, stop the steal, the big lie that you talked about, stop the steal, was the momentum for getting these people there on the 6th. They honestly believe, for whatever reason, maybe too much social media, whatever. Watch social media, that movie. So why they were thinking that that was true, that the election was not legitimate, whatever the reason the president told them. So, okay, so that's the 6th. The week later, we impeach in the House. Thank you to those of you who participated right away. Jamie Raskin. Uh, 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 Ted Lieu and De David Cicilline were David, David Cicilline. They were, they had it all written up and ready to go, bipartisanly, pass the House, and then two days later, ready with the case to take to the Senate. Oh, we can't receive it. Not a question. And then by the law, you're supposed to receive it and the next day start the trial. So for Mitch McConnell who created the situation where it could not have been heard before the 20th or even begun before the 20th in the Senate to say all the things he said, oh my gosh, about Donald Trump and how horrible he was and is, and then say, but the time, the time that the, Democrat, the House chose to bring it over. No, we didn't choose. You chose 
not to receive it. So I think that's really important. And again, it doesn't matter. As Jamie and others have told us, you can have the case after the person is out of office. So it's an elementary discussion. The, con the Senate ruled in that way and, tr and honoring of precedent on this. So it wasn't, it didn't matter, except it was not the reason that he voted the way he did. It was the excuse that he used. And so that's why I think it's important, because that was a very important speech. I thought Chuck Schumer's speech was remarkable in laying it all out. I think he was inspired by all of you, because you raised the level of all of this to such a place of patriotism and knowledge of our country, our history, and, uh, and what we owe our children. Again, we always say, honoring the vision of our founders, worthy of the sacrifice of our men and women in uniform, and respecting the aspirations of our children. They did all of that. And as Jamie, uh, the distinguished lead uh, manager said earlier on this presidential weekend, our sense of, of patriotism is stirred and, and uh, we're called upon in a stronger way. So I want to thank them. I want to thank Stacy Poskett. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Madeline Dean. Thank you very much, Joe Nagus. Thank you, Eric Swalwell. Thank you, Diana DeGette. Thank you, David Cicilline. Thank you, Ted Liu. Thank you, Joaquin Castro. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee's uh, manager on all of this. We just couldn't be prouder. I've been hearing from my grandchildren who are very sad that justice wasn't done. But by 15 votes, the Senate voted uh, uh, to convict a good bipartisan statement about what has happened. It would not have been accomplished without your brilliant uh, presentation. So I thank you for that, and I yield the floor back to all of you as I leave. Thank you, thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, thank you for your confidence in us. I was going to go next to Scott. Were you going to take the next one, David? Is that good? Okay. I was Scott. wondering, though, for the Speaker, if she had a comment about Mr. Connell's statement on the floor suggesting that President Trump still was liable criminally or civilly for everything he did in office. Do you think now that the Justice Department or State Attorney General should uh, pursue the, the legal... He even hedged on that. Remember when he talked about when he talked about incitement, he said he didn't think this rose to level. Oh, and so so, it, uh, uh, so he he was hedging all over the place. I don't know whether it was for donors or or what, but whatever it was, it was a very disingenuous speech. And I say that regretfully because I always want to be able to work work with uh, the leadership of the other party. I think our country needs a strong. Republican Party, it's very important, and for him to have try to have it every which way. But we will be going forward to make sure that this never happens again in terms of what were the, to investigate and evaluate what caused this, and uh, both in terms of its the motivation, but also in terms of the security that we have to have as we go forward, recognizing how inflaming even some of our elected officials uh, can be. But uh, I defer to all these distinguished lawyers about the <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. So, is Speaker Pelosi, is censure I'll come to you and then I'll come to you. I'm sorry. Is, is I'm censure an option right now, then? Censure is a slap in the face of the Constitution. That is, lets everybody off the hook. It lets everybody off the hook. Oh, these cowardly senators who couldn't face up to what the president did and what was at stake for our country are now going to have a chance to give a little slap on the wrist. We censure people for using stationary for the wrong purpose. We don't censure people for inciting insurrection that kills people in the Capitol. Um, yes. possibly leading to other depositions, to then entering uh, an already public statement, an already public statement into the trial record. Did you try and reach out to her at all? And then separately, 
um, did the White House either indirectly or directly have any involvement in the decision to call your witnesses? You know what? I mean, I don't want to um, – we, we tried this case as aggressively we, as we could on the law and on the facts. We did everything that we could. We got from um, the president's lawyers exactly what we wanted, which was the entering into the evidentiary record of the statement by our colleague, Congresswoman Butler. And we got that. I was able to read it before the entire country, and it became part of – uh, the case, and it became an important part of our case. Um, if, again, you know, we could have had 500 witnesses and it would not have overcome the kinds of arguments being made by Mitch McConnell and other Republicans who were hanging their hats on uh, the claim that it was somehow unconstitutional to try a former president or that the First Amendment somehow gave him a right to incite violent insurrection against the Union. Um, and, though, you know, they're going to have to live with those arguments that they made. Uh, but we, we think that we overwhelmingly proved our case. I think Mitch McConnell's statement showed that they knew we overwhelmingly proved our case. And all that might have happened if we had, you know, bargained for 10 witnesses on our side, 10 witnesses on their side, they, the first person they said they wanted to uh, bring up and, uh, and to cross-examine is Nancy Pelosi. They would have turned the whole thing into a circus. And we conducted it with solemnity and legal seriousness and decorum, and you saw the conduct of the lawyers on the other side, and you know what Donald Trump's track record is. We were not going to allow them to turn it into a farce. Yeah. Why didn't you ask the president to call witnesses well, the, the state, at least the first time that I saw the statement was yesterday. It was released. That statement was released yesterday. So, um, I, you know, but what's interesting is that the, the premise of some of these questions is somehow that we failed to prove the facts of the case. I think in the eyes of the entire world and the country, we overwhelmingly proved the facts of the case. And Senator McConnell just conceded that that wasn't the issue. And you got to talk to the, you know, the, the 43 senators who are basically saying no amount of facts would have made any difference to them because they didn't think that the president was subject to the jurisdiction of the Senate. That was the argument you just heard Mitch McConnell make. So I, you know, I mean, forgive me for reacting strongly to that, but uh, that seems to me to be a completely bizarre um, conclusion to these events to say that somehow if we had just had one more witness, Mitch McConnell would have come over to our side. Just listen to his words. Yes. Uh, Congressman, thank you. Uh, just to follow up on your earlier question, did the White House convey to you in any way that they did not want witnesses so that they might draw out the process? Did the White House tell you they wanted a short, condensed trial? I, I never spoke to anyone from the White House or to President Biden or to Vice President Harris. None of them. No. And, and I made the call. So you want to blame somebody? You know. trying to understand how, yeah. in terms of witnesses, how you got from after Well, remember, you know, when when you get in a situation yeah. like this, if you – if look, if we had needed any witnesses to make our case, then we would have gone all the way and insisted on witnesses in a six-week trial or an eight-week trial or whatever. We didn't. We overwhelmingly proved our case. Senator McConnell, the leader of the Republicans in the Senate, just conceded that, right? All of them are saying, well, you, you know, you won on the facts. But uh, you're, you're yeah. so, you said something. It was two two things that we had to do, right? And we, we'll just take one more. We had to first have a motion for witnesses, which we did when we were supposed to do it, which was after the prosecution and the defense made their case. We made a motion to allow for witnesses, and then after that, we requested one witness. The Republican counsel for the president, the former president, said he was going to bring 100 witnesses. We got the essence of what we wanted, which was the statement of Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler. The defense got nothing. And I think that what you're doing is making a lot out of and, and dismissing the incredible evidence of havoc, mayhem, and what this president had done over a period of months to bring destruction to our democracy by talking about if you had two or three more witnesses, what was going to happen. 
One thing I would just add to it is remember, there's a reason that the request for witnesses comes at the conclusion of the case, because we had an opportunity to see the president, the former president's counsel, and decide whether we needed to pr provide additional witnesses. Don't forget, our case was filled with dozens of witnesses who were presented by way of video and statements and recordings. And it was only last night we learned about this new information, and we got the best of both worlds. We got that testimony in the record before the jury. Uh, without any risk associated with it. That, and that's important to remember. This is a congresswoman who repeats a telephone call between Kevin McCarthy and the former president of the United States, in which Kevin McCarthy is pleading for help, saying, help us, we're under attack. The president first tries to blame another group, and Tiffin, he says, no, Mr. President, these are your supporters, and we're in danger here. And he says, well, Kevin, maybe they care more about the election than you do. That came before the Senate jury through the statement that Mr. Raskin read. So we got the evidence in of the witness uh, that we wanted to present, and that was a victory for us. The defendant, President Donald John Trump, was let off on a technicality. And that's essentially what you heard Mitch McConnell say, that they let him off on what they perceived, at least, to be a procedural issue, which was because of the constitutionality of the matter, they couldn't proceed to the substance. Doctrinal interpretation, both on the liberal side and the conservative side, strongly disagrees with that assessment, but they let him off on a technicality. And you also heard Mitch McConnell go up there and say, essentially, that we overwhelmingly proved our case, that substantively, Donald Trump is guilty of inciting an insurrection. And uh, it has been, I know for all of us, an honor to work uh, and a solemn, a solemn honor to work on this case, but, and even though we didn't get 67 votes, this has been the most bipartisan vote for impeachment and conviction ever. And we know that we spoke the truth on the Senate floor and the American people by and large have agreed with us. Uh, and one final remark on all of this, um, you know, this, this episode from January 6th on uh, has been very taxing on the American people. Uh, ushered in a new era, thanks to Donald Trump, of political violence. Uh, and so, most of all, my reaction to the decision of a majority of Republican senators not to convict Donald Trump, despite the overwhelming evidence, is not only sadness, uh, but also apprehension for the nation. Because as I said during my remarks, the defense counsel's main argument is that there's nothing wrong with what Donald Trump did, and he could do it all over again. Uh, and as a nation, uh, we just have to hope that that isn't the case. All right, I think that we're gonna close it up. I just wanna remind everybody that this was the most bipartisan uh, impeachment in the history of the United States. It was the largest vote in the US Senate um, ever to, uh, to convict a president who's been impeached. Um, and it was the most bipartisan uh, conviction vote uh, in the Senate that we've ever seen in a case of a presidential impeachment. But there's one other number to look out for if you listen carefully to what's being said now after the trial. There are 57 senators who voted to convict on the facts in the law. Now, add to that the number of senators who say they believe that Donald Trump was factually guilty, but that the Senate didn't have jurisdiction or there was some other constitutional issue. But just take the ones who say, we don't think that we could convict him because of this January exception. He was able to get away with it at the end of his term. If 10 or 15 or 20 of them say that, that means you've got a supermajority who are saying that the president actually is guilty of his crimes, which we think we have overwhelmingly and convincingly demonstrated to the American people. Thank you all very much.